Before we get started today, I wanted to point out a few key things. Femicide is the epidemic of our time, but we rarely hear about it. It's referred to as domestic violence, but it's truly femicide. It's rampant. And domestic violence is basically advertised as a women's issue, but it is a men's issue, as men are almost always the perpetrators. And men have the power to stop it. Yet we put the onus on women when we give statistics that leave men out and frame the topic as if women perhaps do it to themselves or it's simply an accident or a hazard inherent with the experience of being a woman. I myself am guilty of this and I'm working to be more conscious about it. These seemingly small infractions build to snowball and add to the current condition. There's a taboo around domestic violence and men perpetrate domestic violence and men are given light sentences or not even arrested because other men in authority refuse to hold them accountable. And then those same men go on to kill women and sometimes children as well in the most brutal murders we ever see. And often mass shooters we see have domestic violence backgrounds, but the crime wasn't taken seriously enough to prevent them access to firearms or even to the same partners they've abused or threatened to kill in the past. It is sad as fuck that women like Dawn, a full-time nurse, are burdened with picking up the slack of men in authority, like police, who fail to report these crimes. It is a financial, emotional, and mental burden. And I'm sick of women doing all the work and getting none of the credit or the results. So here we have an interview with Dawn today to start to try to counteract that. I am hopeful that despite the rising rates of men who murder their female partners daily and the blind eye of those in authority and active attempts to shut down women who try to speak out about domestic violence, such as Facebook recently requiring my driver's license before they said they would allow me to share an ad about my domestic violence survival song, which they then refused even still to allow me to share it once they had a copy of my ID. Um, But I am hopeful that with the advent of the internet and the freedom of speech allotted in platforms such as this podcast and the collective angst and unrest of women the world over who are starting to speak out and act out and demand justice, I am hopeful that we have the potential to see domestic violence decrease in our lifetime. Lastly, I want to note that as a victim of domestic violence at the hands of my ex-husband, I experienced the insufficiencies of the systems in place to handle these cases firsthand. The dispatcher gave me the wrong information about whether he'd been served the protective order and whether it was safe for me to go home, which could have ended up in me being murdered by my ex-husband. The courtroom waiting room was set up so that in order to use the women's restroom, I had to walk by the defendant's side where he was sitting. The women's restroom should not be on the defendant's side in a courtroom. The courtroom was set up so that he was sitting at a 90 degree angle to me within 10 feet of me. It was terrifying. Uh, It's a horrid feeling to be in love with and terrified of someone. This is today's story on how we can survive. You know, we're supposed to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and and I don't see that. You know, I, I think that if you have to be concerned about whether or not you're safe every time you go out and, and jog, that's that's an issue. That's a problem. Hello, Starseeds, and welcome to episode number three of Musings from the Rainbow Sparkle Palace, the feminist podcast that circumvents social media bans so that women's voices are heard. I'm your hostess, Berea, Kentucky-based feminist folk punk musician, Rainbow Star, and we have a really special episode for you today. We are going to be speaking about femicide and domestic violence with the amazing Dawn Wilcox out of Texas. She is a registered nurse and she is the head of WomenCountUSA.org where she single-handedly compiles a database of women and girls murdered by men in the U.S. It is my sincere honor to bring you this interview today. Three to four men each day murder their female partners Often, the children of those partners are 
murdered as well or watch their mothers murdered. It's femicide, plain and simple. So it's a definition from the World Health Organization. Violence against women comprises a wide range of acts from verbal harassment and other forms of emotional abuse to daily physical or sexual abuse. At the far end of the spectrum is femicide, the murder of a woman. While our understanding of femicide is limited, we know that a large proportion of femicides are of women in violent relationships and are committed by current or former partners. Femicide is generally understood to involve intentional murder of women because they are women, but broader definitions include any killings of women or girls. Femicide is usually perpetrated by men, but sometimes female family members may be involved. Femicide differs from male homicide in specific ways. For example, most cases of femicide are committed by partners or ex-partners and involve ongoing abuse in the home, threats or intimidation, sexual violence, or situations where women have less power or fewer resources than their partner. Like Don Wilcox said, the most dangerous decision a woman can ever make is who she she partners with because that's the person most likely to kill her and it's the most heartbreaking feeling in the entire world and so confusing to be in love with and yearning for yet simultaneously terrified that you're going to be murdered by your partner like that's such a duality that's excruciatingly painful so anything that our justice system can do to support women who are enduring this and save their lives as well as their children. Anything that anyone can possibly do I, is absolutely worthwhile because studies have shown that when women are doing better in a society, the entire society does better. I mean, let alone the fact that it's the right damn thing to do to support women who give birth to the whole earth. It's like I say in one of my songs, the women give birth to all the earth and the men do all the killing. I got to tell you, I am so sick of it. And it starts with accountability and it starts with support and belief of the victims who bring these issues to their friends and to authorities and authorities doing their jobs and standing up for what is right, standing up for these women and doing everything that they possibly can go above. And I want people to go above and beyond for women because women go above and beyond for other people every day. It has been bred into us by this super patriarchal society that we are the caregivers. And so we give of our life and our body. And the least that others can do is try to support us when we are in need. Another reason that women may not come forward um, and may take their time in coming forward is because of the shame around it. And we may not want to admit that we have been had the wool pulled over our eyes and placed in a situation where now we, we are trying to seek safety and run for our lives from someone who was supposed to be our caregiver, someone who's supposed to care for us, someone who's supposed to be our partner, our equal. And uh, regarding trauma bonds, there's a book called The Betrayal Bond that goes into the bizarre neurology. Basically, it's like Stockholm Syndrome, what happens when you are in a relationship with someone who's abusing you. And this is why women don't leave. The actual chemical makeup of the brain changes and there are different neural pathways that are created that actually bond them emotionally to the person who has perpetrated these acts of violence against them. And in this book, it talks about Stockholm Syndrome. If you're not familiar with where the phrase comes from, it's a really bizarre story. So a group of people were kidnapped, uh, held in a bank for days. And when the police came you know, to save them and arrest their captors, they fought the police and they were they were very angry that the police were, quote unquote, mis mistreating and uh, taking their captors away. And the folks who were kidnapped ended up later reconvening at a wedding where two of the captives married two of the captors. Completely bizarre. So, and of course, they didn't know them before this you know, this incident happened and this crime was committed, you know, when I learned about that, I was like, what the hell? Like, I thought that evolution was supposed to create ways to make it easier for us to survive, but this seems completely counterintuitive and counter to survival. I am really curious as to why 
the hell we would evolve um, to be bonded to people who are violent towards us, but that's the way it is. I also want to talk on narcissism and sociopathy. Uh, you know, I've been obsessed, as many of you have, with these true crime podcasts. Cold is one, Helen Gone, amazing. And a lot of the men that you hear about in these true crime stories definitely hold all the signs of being narcissists and or sociopaths. And something I really want to impress upon people is the fact that some of the worst cases that I've seen where, you know, the, the wife is murdered in a just absolutely unspeakable, horrific, brutal manner, and then later the children murdered in an unspeakable, horrific, brutal manner. The man, it wasn't like she was in an abusive, like an obvious abusive relationship. There was emotional abuse. He pushed her once and then he murdered her and her children. So I think everyone really needs to be educated on narcissism and sociopathy. They are not just words to be thrown around as sometimes they are in popular culture, but they are real mental illnesses with real indications for diagnosis. And I really recommend that everyone be educated so that you know the signs and have the potential to get away if you become involved with someone like this because they're highly manipulative, uh, highly charming. It's really easy to end up in a relationship with someone like this who appears to have your best interest at heart, but really turns out to be someone who has no sense of empathy, which is the perfect recipe for disaster. A narcissist can be characterized by their interactions with you that often include intense praise followed by verbal abuse, and that will be a continuous cycle that uh, increases in intensity of negativity as the relationship goes on. Also, gaslighting is indicative of a narcissistic relationship, which is making you disbelieve your reality or making you feel like you're crazy or forgetful. Like, you know that they said, said or did something, but they keep denying it. Sabotaging your friendships or other relationships, so saying things about people who are close to you, close family and friends, in order to push you away from them, and vice versa. Making you the enemy anytime that you have an issue with their behavior and bring up a request for a change of behavior, or uh, you're then made the bad guy. Constant lying to avoid responsibility. This is a hard one to discern sometimes, because a lot of times their lying is so good that you can't really tell, and also you're you're being gaslit, so you're in a place where you're really vulnerable and questioning your own reality and your own ability to discern what is real and, and what's not. Also, they never take blame or responsibility for any issues that are in the relationship and have a huge sense of entitlement and act like you owe them everything. That is from a website called blessingmanifesting.com. According to Mayo Clinic website, a narcissistic personality disorder is characterized by an exaggerated sense of self-importance, a sense of entitlement, requiring constant admiration, expecting special favors, and unquestioning compliance with their expectations. So if you question them at any point, it's met with violent response. Having an inability or unwillingness to recognize the needs and feelings of others, that's a main, that's a main one for me. So a lot of these true crime podcasts I've been listening to, and I, I hear time and time again, there are chances for a man in authority to do something to stop the serial killer or this domestic violence perpetrator, a domestic abuser, and they don't. There's a podcast called The Man in the Window, and this was a man who, in the, from the 70s, and he murdered dozens of women, I mean, dozens and dozens, and raped dozens more. And uh, he's actually now just now awaiting trial. He was only arrested a few years ago. But um, this podcast goes into detail about how there were so many points where if police had cooperated with one another, rather than thrown their egos around and said, you know, this is out of my jurisdiction, or that's not in your jurisdiction, I'm not going to share information with you about it, they could have caught him. Additionally, there was a crime lab that had just an incredible amount of information, of physical evidence that could have been utilized to catch this man, the lab, rather than testing the material so that they didn't have the equipment. And as it turns out, they had the equipment, they just weren't trained to use it and would not ask for help. It's just, it's just mind blowing. So not only do we definitely, we need men to stop killing women, stop thinking that you have a right to fucking anything really when it comes to a woman. 
but we need men to step up and do their damn jobs and protect the women when when they're given a chance. Put your ego aside, do what is right, and put men behind bars. Uh, I couldn't find the reference to this story when I searched it later online, but I did hear on WEKU uh, 88.9 this week how a third of police who were accused of domestic violence by their partners were allowed to keep their firearms because the judges saw a man in blue as something sacred and not to be touched. You know, you can't punish a man in blue. You should think highly and respect your police officers. So these police officers were beating up and sometimes killing their partners and their partner's children and getting away with it. I want to talk about how Facebook disallowed me to promote my uh, lyric video that I had for a song called Texas Oil Rig, which is metaphorically about domestic violence, though it's not overt. If you don't know it's about domestic violence and you're not paying attention, you certainly wouldn't know when you hear the song. But I wasn't allowed, time and time again, was rejected uh, my attempts to get this message out there about this, this song about surviving domestic violence. And I was told by Facebook that it was about a social or political issue, and I could not run the ad. I also want to note that, you know, the purpose of this song, it is to uplift other women who have survived or are dealing with domestic violence. There are references in the video to resources, the domestic violence hotline, which is at 1-800-799-7233. That's 800-799-SAFE. In light of that, I'm going to go ahead and share the song with you now. This is Texas Oil Rig by Rainbow Star.
What is domestic violence? Uh, The definition, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, is a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that is used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another intimate partner. Domestic violence can be physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions or threats or threats of actions that influence another person. This includes any behaviors that intimidate, manipulate, humiliate, isolate, frighten, terrorize, coerce, threaten, blame, hurt, injure, or wound someone. So it doesn't have to be physically visible. And I'm happy to say that just this year in the UK, coercive control has become illegal. Coercive control is definitely an an accessory behavior that is part of domestic violence, domestic abuse, and all too often leads to a man murdering a woman and or her children. According to rightsofwomen.org.uk, Coercive control is when a person with whom you are personally connected repeatedly behaves in a way that makes you feel controlled, dependent, isolated, or scared. The following types of behavior are common examples of coercive control. Isolating you from your friends and family. Controlling how much money you have and how you spend it. Monitoring your activities and your movements. Repeatedly putting you down, calling you names, or telling you that you are worthless. Threatening to harm or kill you or your child threatening to publish information about you or to report you to the police or the authorities, damaging your property or household goods, forcing to take part in criminal activity or child abuse, end quote. There's a resource I want to share with you I have had on my phone for a long time. It is an app to improve your safety, and it's called Noonlight. It's like Moonlight, but with an N for Nancy. And I'll have a link to it in the show notes at rainbowstarmusic.com slash episode three. So what this app is, I basically, if I pick up my phone and swipe left, I don't even have to unlock it. I can push a button and authorities are sent to where I am immediately. I've not ever had to use it. So I don't know. I can't tell you beyond that. Like, I know that they have the ability to send an ambulance and police. I don't know if they happen to send, send both. If you're, you're non-responsive, I imagine they might send both. That's definitely worth looking into and verifying. Uh, I highly recommend that all women have that app on their phone just because 911 has not been so easy to deal with in my experience. So there are other resources as well for women who are in abusive relationships and don't know how to get out and feel like completely at a loss of control in regards to their ability to leave their partners. Um, In addition to the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which I would first recommend uh, once you're safe, I would recommend the 12-step group called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And I will link that in the show notes. Um, There are phone meetings. There are face-to-face meetings in some locations around the states. And it's a program to connect you to uh, your ability to fulfill yourself and not look to another person for that. And also heals just that, that need to have validation from another person, that need to have your safety wrapped up in another person and another person's actions. And there are some tools there to help heal Uh, the wounds of having been in abusive relationships. Uh, Now it's time for the feminist pro tip of the day. When your friend says she's been a victim of domestic violence, believe her and direct her to the domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Now, without further ado, my promised interview with Dawn Wilcox, the registered nurse out of Texas who is single-handedly documenting and creating a database of women and girls murdered by men in the U.S. every day. So first, would you briefly be able to share the catalyst for your desire to single-handedly take on the heavy burden of counting murdered women and girls? 
the biggest thing is finding out that really no one was doing this, um, which I was pretty shocked about. Um, you know, I know that definitely homicides are tracked to some extent. And as I looked at those numbers, I found that either femicides weren't really put in a separate category very well, or that information just didn't even exist. And something that's kind of shocking that I found out since I started doing this work is that even though police departments are supposed to report their homicides to the federal level, to something that's called like the UCR, that's the Uniform Crime Report, that they often don't do that and it's not compulsory. So um, we really don't know what the numbers are overall for homicide, never mind femicide. The Murder Accountability Project was started by a journalist and some criminologists and other people who are interested in unsolved murders in the United States. And they've actually, um, I think they started uh, looking into like the federal level and whether or not they were even reporting their own investigations. In other words, if the FBI or like the marshals. U.S. Marshals and those kinds of organizations were even following following their own rules, and they found that there had not been a single homicide reported by the FBI or any uh, federal agency to their own reporting system. So I think they are, I think they started a lawsuit. So that is all very shocking because. To me, you know, especially as a registered nurse, whenever I, like, take care of a patient, I have to assess them first to see, you know, what kind of symptoms they're having before I try to um, do any kind of treatment. So all of the the so-called information and crime stats and all those things that are being released are really being released based on faulty numbers. Wow. Well, it really just ties in with um, what I was talking about earlier on the, this podcast episode about how a lot of these murders occur because men in authority don't do their jobs. Like, I'm guessing, I am guessing that a lot of the people who are supposed to report this, who are in police, just from what I know about, you know, the gender difference in the police department, are men. Um, <laughs> that's It's just infuriating to me. Um, and also a lot of these I would say a large majority. Do you have a percentage? I'm wondering on like how many of these murders are perpetrated by men? The ones that I track, 100%, because I when I track uh, femicides, I track um, women who are murdered by men. So specifically, I'm tracking women and girls who are murdered by men and boys in the United States. Um, you know, and that doesn't, that's not to say that it's not a global issue. issue. It certainly is. Um, and m- the the whole idea of, of femicide as a concept was really started by uh, Latin American women. So they've been way ahead of the U.S. in looking at this as a problem and um, and that sort of thing. But yeah, I think that um, men make up you know the large uh, proportion of law enforcement officials, whether that be. Uh, police or prosecutors or courts or, um, you know, parole boards. And I've often said that they really don't have any skin in the game because if you release a serial rapist or uh, a man who has committed serial violence against women, you aren't going to be his choice of prey. It's going to be women and girls. So, you don't really have anything at risk. You know, I would imagine if there was a killer who was, uh, like, targeting police officers or something like that, you know, they probably wouldn't be let out of prison or Mm -hmm. be given a slap on the wrist like we see time and time again. And, And actually, you're making an excellent point, and that is something that I've begun tracking as I document women who are murdered, I am, um, you know, tracking whether or not they were free to reoffend, what I call kind of free to reoffend. And that is that, you know, they were in police, you know, line of sight. They were um, maybe arrested or, you know, in in the um, 
criminal justice system, but they were like, they were given like a crazy low bail or let out, you know, over and over again. And I especially see that kind of thing in the seventies and eighties. It's just um, amazing to me the the ways that men were just let out over and over again when they were um, strangling women, serial rapists, um, all this kind of behavior. And they really did get a slap on the wrist. And I can't say that things have changed all that much, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, men um, definitely make up the large portion of, of people who work in criminal justice. And I've said time and time again that, you know, men who, especially who commit serial rape and serial, what I call serial femicide, you know, I don't just call them serial killers. They are specifically committing serial femicide, which is a, you know, sort of a term that I've coined to describe something that I'm seeing. And um, these men are really... um, not able to operate at the level that they do and kill the number of women that you see, somebody like a Gary Ridgway or a Ted Bundy, without the supposedly good men who are supposed to be catching them and putting them away, sort of not doing their job. So it's, you know, there's two sides of the coin. You got the guys who are perpetrating the violence and the guys who are sort of allowing it to continue. And I understand that police are often... um, you know, overworked and really they are understaffed. Um, And I think there's a lot of police officers and homicide detectives who really do care, who are exemplary, who take files home and who work on cases for decades, even after retirement. And those are the guys that we need to emulate. But there are also others who, you know, don't make the effort that they should be or don't ask for help. You know, it's a very territorial kind of job. A lot of times police departments aren't talking to each other. You know, there's a lot of egos involved. And unfortunately, it's women um, who suffer. What are the stats and have you seen them change at all? I started in... 2016 and and really heavily in like early 2017 and I think they are definitely not going down if anything I think that I'm you know we're seeing a little bit of an increase in the number of especially domestic violence femicides from everything that you know I see in the news and in you know policymakers and people who do kind of study this. And once again, they're studying numbers that may not be complete, right? So um, I I think it's an even worse problem than we know. Um, One of the issues that I see is that, you know, even though homicides are, from everything I've read, homicides are going down overall, uh, murders of women are not. And like I said, specifically those that are perpetrated by intimate partners, whether they're current or, or former partners. So, um, and, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of changes from year to year. I certainly see um, many women back in the 70s and 80s, because I've, I've begun counting and documenting women all the way back to 1950, which will be a lifelong project. I have thousands and thousands of women to add, but um, I do notice that back in like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, even 90s, you know, a guy would just say, oh, she ran off, and there would be very little investigation. They would take his word for it. I've seen cases specifically where those women were found buried in their own backyards um, decades later, and, you know, the guy just told the cops, yeah, she ran off, and nobody ever looked into it. Uh, I do think there is more skepticism on the on the part of the police when they hear that sort of narrative from a husband or a boyfriend. I think we've learned that lesson that that's one of the first people we need to look at because women are frequently murdered by people they know and trust, specifically current or former partners, and then other men uh, in the periphery, whether it be other male family members or, um, you know, co-workers, neighbors, acquaintances, friends, and those kind of things. Wow. And I wonder what kind of changes you see this work making now or potentially making in the future. I think in order to tackle any problem, you need to know how big it is. 
And I, I really believe that we don't have a clear understanding of exactly how many women have and, you know, in the past and are currently being murdered by men. When I look for women's cases, I typically use Google, Google Alerts, you know, searches, you know, old newspapers. And all the cases that I find pretty easily are cases that journalists cared enough to write about. So that was on their radar. Um, and what really troubles me is those women, particularly marginalized women, women who are, you know, commercially sexually exploited or who are were homeless or home insecure or who were, um, you know, gender nonconforming or um, drug addicted or any of those kind of things that we see that um, we now recognize puts women at special risk for being targeted by violent violence, you know, by men or violent men. And also it puts them in a category of, um, you know, what I've heard referred to as sort of the less dead where they don't get the attention and they don't get um, the compassion and the empathy and the care um, for their cases and for their deaths that other women's cases do. Um, so, you know, that's, an, that's another issue that I see. And you've also been working to change the way that these cases are reported, right? So journalists tend to report in ways that are not helpful to the victims. Is that right? Yeah. So part of what I do is is not just document, you know, women and girls who have been murdered by men, but I also I challenge media narratives of report reports of their murders and of domestic violence. Um, there have been patterns that I've seen over and over again in the reporting of women's murders, like he just snapped. Um, and we, we know, and I know from doing this work that many of these murders, particularly domestic violence, femicides are meticulously premeditated. So there's a lot of forethought that goes into it. It's planned ahead. Uh, there are rarely cases where, you know, a guy just walks in and catches her in bed with somebody else and just snaps and kills her or whatever. Um, most of these men are not mentally ill. Uh, that's kind of why I object to this whole uh, idea of calling them monsters. I think when you call men like, for example, Christopher Watts a monster, and Chris killed his wife, uh, Shanann, and their two daughters, uh, I believe in Colorado recently in the last year, and that was a very high-profile case. And we saw a lot of pictures on social media. You know, he's a great-looking guy, big smile, great, seemed to be a very involved great dad. Um, but what he did was mon monstrous, but he's very much a man. And we need to understand that men who sit across the table from their wife and their children eating Cheerios for 10 years are capable of really horrendous and vicious uh, and callous murders, you know, and not to get too graphic, but this is a guy who strangled his wife, buried her in a shallow grave, suffocated both of his daughters, and had to break their shoulders to get their bodies in an oil tanker. So, you know, when we classify someone like that as a monster, I think it makes, in our minds, uh, makes us have this idea that he couldn't control himself, that he's just this mythical creature, that, you know, this is something that's beyond, um, you know, our human ability to to change. Uh, this is very much a regular guy, a husband, a father, who saw his wife and his two girls as an impediment to a new life that he wanted to start with someone else, and he brutally killed them. Um, so he's not a monster, he's a man, and so just Things like that, things uh, I often see um, sometimes when women are killed, uh, they allow the murderer to control the narrative. And just like victors in war get to write the history books, um, men who murder women get to say what happened. And sometimes it's not really questioned. It's just kind of printed as fact. So Things like, you know, the Fifty Shades of Grey defense. She wanted me to strangle her to death while we were having sex. Well, 
we know that it takes many, many minutes to kill a woman by strangulation. You know, there were multiple physical symptoms that a man's going to see as he's strangling a woman to death. So, you know, this isn't just like a snap judgment. This is, you know, she's going to lose bladder control. She's going to lose bowel control. She's going to start to have a seizure. So when you know these things and you hear a guy describe strangling a woman during sex as just kind of like a oopsie thing, that's baloney and BS. Um, there is a lot of crime scene staging that's not recognized in the reporting of of murders, you know, men will stage things to look like suicides. Um, you know, there's just some really egregious cases that I've read about where there's just no way the woman killed themselves and guys have gotten away with it. Um, so while I think that journalists, they're extremely important and the work they do is extremely important because they can shape attitudes. You know, the people who read newspapers, read media are ones who are going to serve on juries. Um, a lot of people don't know a lot about femicide or domestic violence or violence against women. And so journalists can really shape attitudes, but at the same time, they can also allow murderers to kind of skate by on all these excuses. You know, I just blacked out. I see that a lot. A lot of guys will say, oh, I just blacked out. I don't remember doing that. Um, and, you know, just some really uh, some statements that really stretch credibility <laughs> Um, so I, I do challenge the media, um, narratives of, of domestic violence and femicide for those reasons. And I remember hearing an interview with you where you, you also stated that these are some of the most brutal murders ever. And also there's a significant portion of them during which the children are murdered as well. Yeah, I would say that, you know, most murders of women are probably single offender, single victim events, but then there are definitely are cases that are familicides or where, you know, that the, the um, perpetrator kills a child and kills themselves or kills the woman and, you know, the children um, and, you know, and then does not kill themselves. So definitely I see that. And I also see many cases where children are present, either, you know, in view of of their mother as she's being murdered or in the house. Uh, that's not at all uncommon. And, you know, going back to journalistic phrasing and reporting, we'll typically see that the children were not harmed. And, you know, I think we need to be very careful maybe to say that the children weren't physically harmed, but I would argue that, you know, a child who's present and watches their mother be stabbed to death or shot in the head or, beaten to death certainly is has been harmed and you know probably for their lifetime uh, it's a, would be an extremely traumatic event yeah children are frequently present or basically collateral victims of the murders of the, their mothers and what has surprised you the most about doing this work you know, going back to what we just said in the in the last comment, the brutality. I, I've not read of cases of men who kill other men in such really vile ways outside of things like, you know, drug cartels or gangs or ISIS, you know, ter you know, terrorism events or things like that. You know, women are regularly beheaded either as a cause of death or post-mortem. You know, I have cases of women who are just beaten to their unrecognizable, who are, you know, stabbed dozens and dozens and dozens of time, times and, you know, overkill. Uh, when, when men kill other men and men are more frequently homicide victims, it's usually things like bar fights or drug deals gone wrong or in the course of other criminal activity or gang activity. Women are killed by men at their children's birthday parties, at work, while they're taking a shower, while they're in their nursing home beds. Something that I'm seeing more commonly is that, you know, women who can change where they live, can go to a domestic violence shelter, can hide from their abuser in their personal lives, still have to go to work. And that's where he knows he can find her. So women are being really basically hunted by men for revenge um, because they have chosen to 
either, you know, end a relationship or not be in a relationship with them or as prey by strangers, you know, for, you know, sexually motivated crimes, you know, the kind of things we do see with serial killers or serial rapists and killers, you know, in those cases, I've, I've seen, um, you know, men say they just saw a woman walk from her car to her house and decided to kill her. And I've often talked about this. We, as women, uh, have to navigate half of the population not knowing which ones, you know, mean us harm. And they don't come with labels. You know, I've said, you know, if we were to go out into the jungle and, you know, you and I were walking around and we know tigers are dangerous, you know, if we see, you know, orange and black and white stripes, we're going to be out of there. But we have to live and exist in a world where, you know, half of the population could be um, the one who's going to harm us. And that's extremely stressful. I mean, especially if you're aware of that, Um, certainly doing this work and a lot of my life experiences have made me very cautious around men. And I don't, I don't think that's paranoia. I think that's smart. And I think you should be cautious around men, no matter how good looking they are, no matter how charming they are, you need to be careful because there are a lot of very dangerous men out there. Hey, women to that. And I was recently banned for a week on Facebook for saying that men are dangerous in a post inviting women to uh, join me in a gun safety course. (laughs) You're not allowed to say certain things, but you know, and there's some great men out there. Of course there are. But when you look at the criminal justice system as a whole and you look at all of, you know, the violent crime and you do look at the statistics and you see that, you know, the the lion's share of all the violent crime, murders and all that that sort of thing are committed by men, you know, almost, almost 100% of sexual assaults, you know, unless... You know, when you consider like women who are, you know, sexually assaulting young boys and things like that, you know, through school employment, which I've seen more of lately and is very disturbing. But as far as, you know, violent sexual assaults where, you know, it's just even a stranger and they knock you over the head and rape and murder you, you just that's almost unheard of that it's a female perpetrator. You know, we have to kind of look at that and say, what's going on? What? You know, it's. A, I think it's a lot of things, and like I've I've talked about many times, I think femicide is sort of the end game. It's the end of the road. It's where a lot of other injustices of against women and girls lead. You know, de- dehumanizing language about women and girls, and unchecked harassment and sexual harassment, and women who can't even go for a jog without being, you know, harassed, or men attempting to kidnap them, or even being kidnapped and raped, you know, just while you're jogging, you know, we're supposed to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and and I don't see that, you know, I, I think that if you have to be concerned about whether or not you're safe every time you go out and, and jog, that's, that's an issue, that's a problem, and I, I think you're right that sometimes we're not allowed to say that, but that's the truth. Absolutely. And how can people help you? Because you are one woman doing this entire big job. One way that people can help me is by sending me cases to She Counted. So it's S-H-E-C-O-U-N-T-E-D at gmail.com. And, you know, I just want to create at least a repository in my email. And, you know, it's going to take me a long time to go through them all. But I do do go through them from multiple sources. If if I get cases there, it really helps me a lot because it's kind of narrowing down where I get them instead of getting them like through Messenger and and other places. So that that is extremely helpful because I don't hear about all of them. Um, you know, sometimes somebody might live in a small town where there's something that's happened locally. Uh, so that is extremely helpful. I'm trying to get to the point where I can have volunteers help me. Awesome. And you've got an email sitting in there from me, too. <laughs> to Thank volunteer. you. Of course. Thank um, you. And just um, be patient because I do work full time. You know, I work about 50 hours a week and I drive like about 10. So that's 60. And then I do this about 25 to 30 hours a week. So it is, you know, 
the first thing I get up and I start working on in the morning until I have to leave for work. And then the first thing I work on when I get home. But if you don't hear from me, if I don't write back, I apologize. It's, you know, I will eventually get to cases that you've sent to me and, um, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely. We appreciate you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with people? You know, that I guess a couple of things I'd like to say is if there's something that you see that you identify that you think needs to be changed, don't wait for permission. I am not, I'm just a nurse, you know, I'm a school nurse and I, I live in Texas and I didn't wait for permission to do this. I thought about going back to grad school, but it's like, I can't do this work and be a graduate student. So I don't feel like this is something that's not in my pay grade. I don't feel like this is something that I have no business doing. Uh, nobody was doing exactly what I'm doing and it needed, to, it needs to be done and it needs to stay on the grassroots level. So, um, you know, I would just say to, if you see some area of, you know, violence against women or whatever it is that you're passionate about, don't be afraid to dive in and to make changes in the areas that you see that are, that are lacking because you never know what could happen. I've had an incredible response. I've had, you know, criminal justice uh, professors and people in law enforcement and documentary filmmakers, all kinds of people reach out to me about the work that I'm doing. So that's very heartening to me because it can be very isolating. And it, it is a subject that I think a lot of people don't care about. And I don't think as a society we care enough about it. So it's, it was very heartwarming to me to see so many people really do care about this issue. And then try to, in a kind way, to educate people. If you see an article that's written that is victim blaming or, you know, uses terms like things like um, child pornography, it's not child pornography, it, they're child you know, images of child sexual abuse or something like that. A child cannot be in pornography. So you can, you know, write to that journalist and, like, don't be mean, don't be judgmental. Say, hey, you know, I'm so glad that you wrote about this. I can tell that you really care about this issue. But, you know, you might want to think about how this term sounds and, you know, maybe this would be a, a better substitute so, you know, if you write to people and you're yelling at them and you're demeaning and rude, they're not going to listen and they're not going to change. But I've written to many, many journalists, prosecutors, police, all kinds of people with that, with those kind of suggestions. And maybe they never thought about it before. So there's ways to even make little changes in the way that we think about violence against women. Well, and I would say you are making a big change. Thank you. I, this is definitely is my passion. I care about it very much. You know, I carry a lot of these women's stories with me, and I, I see it as really sacred work and an honor. And, you know, it is very sad, but I, I don't want these women to be forgotten. I, I find as I'm doing this, you know, we've got old newspaper clippings and things of women who are killed back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But because so much of what we do now is digital, I'm really worried about where is that stuff going to go? You know, where, where are those stories going to go? Are they going to disappear? And are these women going to be forgotten? So I want to make sure that I create sort of this repository that says they were here, this terrible thing happened to them, but they had these full, wonderful lives. People love them, and they matter, and we need to change this. We need to make it better. Absolutely, and on behalf of all women, I thank you for this sacred work you're doing. Well, thank you, and I appreciate you reaching out to me, and I enjoyed talking to you. That was such an amazing interview. I'm super Grateful to Dawn for spending time talking to me today. All the necessary links you'll definitely want to check out at rainbowstarmusic.com slash episode three, or you can always go to simply rainbowstarmusic.com slash podcast. And the question of the week, have you or someone you love experienced domestic violence? How did you recover? You can share your stories by writing me at info at rainbowstarmusic.com. And let me know if you're all right with me sharing the story on the air. You can listen to the podcast on any of your favorite platforms, including Spotify and YouTube. Just search Musings from the Rainbow Sparkle Palace. 
You can find us on Insta at Palace Podcast. This episode was written, edited, and produced by me, Rainbow Star. And the background music is also written by me. New episodes release every Wednesday, so keep coming back. You're welcome to subscribe, rate, review, and share, and let others know that feminist voices are well worth hearing. Stay fierce, stay sparkly.